This is Colonia Cast episode episode 18. Thank you for joining us. You can find us at theturtleroom.org slash coloniacast where you can learn more about our program and access the Colonia Cast Student Research Fund, where we'll be supporting student-led research that's turtle focused. Um, today we've got Dr. Craig Adler on. Uh, Dr. Adler is a professor emeritus in the Department of Behavior and Neurobiology uh, in the College in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at Cornell University. Um, Dr. Adler is the author in over 150 <laughs> peer-reviewed publications and, and sort of even many different books uh, dealing with, with subjects as wide-ranging as sort of his primary research focus in reptilian navigation and orientation uh, to ecology, evolutionary biology, and systematics of reptiles and amphibians. Um, he's also, beyond this, uh, is also the co-founder and past president of the Society for the Study of Amphibians and Reptiles, which is the largest professional grouping of herpetologists in the, in the world. Uh, he's also been supported by many different uh, scientific societies and, and very prestigious institutions uh, doing some incredible research uh, and we're really excited to have him on today just to talk about some of his adventures and some of his, his past research. So thanks for coming on, Dr. Adler. Thank you, Michael. Thank thank all of you for joining me this morning. I look forward to talking with you. This is a great opportunity. All right. And to get us started, um, what first got you interested in reptiles? Slash, where does your passion begin? And what made you decide to pursue reptile research? <laughs> Well, probably like all of you, I got started when I was a kid, you know, and uh, my, my grandfather uh, bought me a turtle, a baby turtle. Now, this is, this is in the mid-40s, right after the Second World War, and things were getting back to normal, and uh, in the pet shops, you could get baby turtles. You know, they were normally uh, red-eared sliders. And uh, one of the problems was, of course, they painted the top of the shell. And I knew that was bad. I didn't know exactly why when I was five years old, but I knew that was not a good idea. So I would take tweezers and take all that paint off so that the shell could grow. So I started with that. And then I bought uh, a Knowles at the circus when it came to town. And this is in Lima, Ohio. We didn't have a university. There was no museum. So... The big deal every year was the was the circus coming to town. It was quite a big deal. Um, so that's when it started, I would say. And then it was a very private hobby of mine because I had no friends who had an interest in reptiles or amphibians. Um, you know, there was no Internet, of course. Uh, I wasn't allowed to make long distance telephone calls. Uh, so it was uh, people I knew at school and so forth. And nobody at school had the interest that I had. And so I would say the second most important thing besides getting started was I finally found a buddy. And that buddy was a guy named David Dennis, who uh, ended up being the co-founder of the SSAR with me. And he's still my best buddy after, gosh, this started in 19, uh, we, we met each other when we were about 12, 13 years old when we were down catching snakes, each of us separately. And we ran into each other out in the field and I was catching banded water snakes and he was catching queen snakes. So we were, we were already uh, finding, you know, habitat specializations that neither of us knew anything about. And I wondered, I said, well, David, where did you, where'd you get these, these queen snakes? He said, oh, they're up in the bushes. I never looked up in the bushes and he didn't look under the big, big boulders where I was finding the, anyway, that's how we met and we became fast friends. And it's so important to have a friend that you can share your excitement with and go out in the field with. The internet makes part of that possible today, but going out on field trips together and, and, uh, I would, we would get together almost every weekend. And as soon as he got a driver's license, he was a little older than me. We would head off to the field in Southern Ohio and um, catch all sorts of things. We didn't tell our parents exactly what we were catching down there in Southern Ohio, <laughs> uh, timber rattlesnakes, for example. 
So we, we never brought those back. So that's how the interest started. And then, and then, you know, it's just a natural progression. And, you know, I didn't realize when I was that young that I was going to end up a college professor. I just wasn't, I didn't know enough. And uh, so people thought I was going to be a medical doctor. I had no interest in being a medical doctor. Uh, I just wanted to work with the animals. They just fascinated me. I, I watched, I liked watching them eat and locomote and so forth. And so I had quite a collection down in my parents' basement. And, and um, Dave and I just followed our interest. And so that's the answer to your, to your question, Jack, how I, how I got, got rolling. And then eventually it just, just morphed into, it's kind of the stage you guys are at right now. You're going from high school into college and, and uh, your, your interest in herps and turtles is going to take you and, and interesting directions. And none of you can predict exactly where you're going to end up even 10 years from now. Um, but as, you, as long as you follow your, you know, your interests, uh, it, things will work out. You know, I mean, I never worried about it. Uh, even though I, and there was nobody in my large high school that uh, was interested in reptiles and amphibians. I didn't care. It really didn't matter to me. And then once David came along, oh boy, that was, that was great. So, so for me, it was just a natural progression. And then suddenly I, I suddenly realized maybe my freshman year in college, oh my gosh, I'm on a career path here. I, I'm going to be like that guy down there giving the lecture someday. And so suddenly I started paying attention more to what the professors were doing, not just in the classroom, but what they did in the laboratory and in the field and so forth. So I got a better understanding of what, it, what life was like for a university professor. It's, it's good to know, too, I think as we're all kind of progressing from high school to college, that's something that's all kind of on our mind is, you know, how, how do we make this, this passion a career? And it's, it's good to hear that it's not something really to worry about that things sort of fall into place. Right. So let me just, just point out that Dave Dennis's career moved in a very different direction. So here we were doing the same things and Dave actually became a very famous biological artist and photographer. And maybe you can see behind me, there's a picture on the wall up there with a turtle. Can you see it? Yep, we can see yeah. it. The wall. That was, let me, I've got a print of that. Let me just show you that a little closer up so you can, so you can see what it looks like. I don't want to take that oh, thing. Wow. Whoa. So here's, here's what uh, David's turtle looks like. That's that is incredible. By the detail, oh, that's actually amazing. Yeah, a nice painted turtle. Just is a that a midland? Turtle. I can't. What? A yeah. midland painted turtle? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's an Ohio, an Ohio turtle. So that's the sort of that's the that's career right. he developed, and so he became he became head of the biological illustration unit at Ohio State University. So he was doing artwork for the faculty members over there. And then on the side, he was doing photography and, and, and uh, uh, pick, uh, you know, doing uh, commission paintings like that one on the wall. That's, that's the original that uh, he gave me many, many years ago, back in the 70s, I guess. So he, that was his career and he's, he's retired now, but he still does photography. Uh, you'll see his, uh, in Duhlman's book on the Highland Frogs of Middle America, Dave Dennis did all of the illustrations in there. Uh, he's illustrated many books. Um, sometimes it's on the title page. Sometimes it's not. Uh, he did one of the little handbooks by, by uh, Hobart Smith and, and Ed Brody in the, in the Zim series. You know, that uh, he did all the, all the illustrations in there. So, so even though we started off doing similar things, our careers really were quite different from one, one to the other. Right. There's a lot of ways that you can take sort of the, the, the herpetological or just animal interest. I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, speaking of artists, I have to, uh, Matt Patterson is another artist that's doing a lot of good turtle work. 
you can see sort of behind me. I don't the screens all night, but uh, he sent me a picture of a wood turtle actually that was just an incredible thing and, and a really kind of nice gesture. So shout out to Matt and if if anyone is is looking for some cool turtle art, Matt Patterson is a great place to to go. Um, I guess sort of um, you've done a lot of work with the orientation of reptiles and, and I guess kind of how that works. Maybe you can like, what got you interested in that specifically and kind of what kind of questions did you tackle? Well, you know, you have to go back and say, you know, when I was in graduate school, I thought I was going to do systematics and biogeography. And so I went on an expedition to Mexico and I had fun. I discovered some new species of frogs, which I, I named and so forth. Uh, but I just, you know, that once I had done the work, it, it, it didn't really uh, uh, excite me all that much. So I decided to look around. And fortunately, I had a professor at the University of Michigan who allowed me to choose my own doctoral thesis topic without any restrictions whatsoever. So, the, you know, that responsibility was on, on my shoulders. So I had, to, I had to decide, well, maybe I better try a little of this and a little bit of that. So the next thing I... I actually did was I started looking at, at turtles and I had taken a course in paleontology. And so I thought, oh, maybe I'll look at turtle paleontology and turtle zooarchaeology. So I did that for a year or, or two and I published a number of papers. I mean, you know, when I was looking at it, I was pretty serious about it and I got deeply into it and published some papers and, uh, uh, but then I decided uh, I really wanted to do something that was experimental. Uh, and uh, so then I went to South America for a summer because I wanted to work on marsupial frogs. You know, these frogs that stuff the eggs in the female, the male, as they're, as they're fertilizing the eggs, the male takes his hind legs and rams those fertilized eggs up into a pouch on the female's back. And, uh, and then she keeps them in that pouch and she hops around with all the eggs in this pouch on her back. You can't see it. It's like a marsupium on a, on a kangaroo. And uh, that fascinated me. So I went to South America for, <laughs> for a summer and uh, I found a few. I didn't find enough marsupial frogs to be able to make a thesis of it. So that was, that was the end of that idea. Uh, and then I came back to Ann Arbor and I started doing little studies on, on salamander movements. And, and uh, you know, I was interested in how salamanders got to the breeding ponds in the spring and how they go back to their, their areas uh, during the rest of the year, their movement pattern. So that's when interest in orientation started. So then I went down to Mountain Lake Biological Station where I did my, my actual thesis research. Uh, the field research and all the laboratory experiments were done back at the uh, University of Michigan in the um, in the environmental chambers. So it was really an interest in doing experiments to try to sort out how animals move in space using uh, amphibians as my as my examples. So, um, but I had to I had to look at well what are the what are the uh, daily variations and and so forth? And so I had to I had to look at circadian rhythms, these physiological rhythms that each of us has. This is how you anticipate your alarm clock in the morning because your physiological rhythm is working and tells you what time it is to get up before the before the alarm goes off. Uh, so you have a sense of internal time, and animals in general have this, and herps do certainly. So I focused on circadian rhythms and did a lot of research, but this was all experimental research. By experimental, I mean, you're doing uh, studies with experimental animals and control animals, and you're comparing the two groups to look for the differences in, as, in, a, in a way that you can then discern exactly what's going on. So um, that really, I really enjoyed that kind of work. And then I decided to move more generally into orientation and navigation. And so that's the area that I spent uh, much of my 
time. Uh, uh, I was on the faculty at Notre Dame for a short time, and then I moved to Cornell, and I've been at Cornell since 1972. And so uh, I and many of my students, but not all of them, uh, have worked on uh, animal orientation and navigation. It's a pretty interesting subject because I think a lot of times as, as humans, we, we've made it easier on ourselves to, to, to navigate in a lot of ways, but certain animals, and I think turtles even are, are a good example for this, but obviously you've focused more on, on other species, lizards and amphibians, uh, but just it's incredible kind of the innate ability that animals have to, to home or to decide where to go, right? Um, it's kind of interesting that you mentioned the circadian rhythm. Uh, I, I understand that that is kind of control. We don't necessarily know everything that controls that and, and those pathways, but that a lot of that could be due to these extra ocular photoreceptors. And that maybe isn't intuitive for a lot of our listeners that, that you can sense light, not just through the eyes. Maybe you could talk about that. Well, you know, these circadian rhythms, uh, normally for species on the earth, these rhythms are 24 hour rhythms because we live in a 24 hour environment. Uh, light dark cycles are on a 24 hour uh, cycle. But of course, the daylight periods get shorter and longer depending on what time of year it is. So if an animal's going to have, have a clock, they have to be able to have a, a clock where you can change the, the hands on the clock, so to speak. Uh, internally to adjust to what the actual environmental light dark cycles are because if you, if you don't have your clock right then you're going to misinterpret the orientation cues like the position of the sun the sun obviously is in a very different place in the morning than it is in the afternoon so it's not a fixed cue it's not like a tree you know i'm going to orient to that tree over there and that tree's going to be there for the rest of my life if I'm a salamander. So that's a fixed cue. And so that's a different kind of cue. It's not a time compensated cue. The sun is a time compensated cue because you have to take the time of day into account in order to use the sun as a cue. The same is true of polarized light because polarized light depends on the position of the sun. And so if you know what time of day it is. If your internal clock tells you it's nine o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the afternoon, then you can look at the polarized light patterns in the sky or the position of the sun and you can figure out which is north, south, east, and west. So this is a honeybee, you know, a honeybee in nature normally lives down in a hollow cavity in a, in a, in a tree, not a beehive in a farmer's backyard, but in a hollow tree. So they can't see the sun, but normally they can see a little patch of blue skylight out the entrance. And, the, and as long as they can see a little patch of blue skylight, they can figure out where the sun is because the polarized, polarized light patterns in the sky have this fixed relationship to the position of the sun. So if they can see a patch of blue and if it's not overcast, you got to be able to see the blue sky. Uh, then you know where the sun is. And if you know the position of the sun and your internal clock tells you what time of day it is, then you integrate those two pieces of information. And now you can figure out where north, south, east, and west are. How, how do you, does one sort of isolate that in an experiment, right? If you, because the position of the sun and then polarization patterns are related, but it could be two separate things, right? You could have the sun might not be out. You still have these polarization patterns occurring. How, how do you separate that experimentally? Well, for, for, you know, there are, you know, Polaroid sunglasses. Have you ever had a pair of Polaroid sunglasses? Yep. I've got them on me. <laughs> they, they are and so, so if, if you had light shining on your face that was not polarized, the, the sunglasses would actually polarize them because it would only allow the light that's vibrating in a particular plane to get through the sunglasses. So you can take a piece of Polaroid film. In fact, I got them from the Polaroid Corporation. They sent me 
as much as I wanted, just big, big sheets that I could take scissors and cut them out and use them in different ways. And uh, <clears throat> and then you train your salamanders in a, in a pool. You're trying to train them along a land water inter uh, axis. So they live on the land, you take them off, you put them in the water every morning, they crawl back to the land in a particular compass direction. And so you're trying to teach them to move in that direction. So if you put the Polaroid uh, overhead, they're doing it under polarized light with a certain axis of vibration. So then when you test them in an arena, so now you've got a big 30, 360 degree arena. So the salamander can go in any, any possible direction. And over that arena, you put the Polaroid film which has an axis of vibration. And so the salamanders will then move with respect to that polarized light in a particular direction. So you, you, you move the Polaroid filter 90 degrees, their orientation changes by 90 degrees. So that's how an experiment, that's one, just one example. Then you can cover them and they're using their third eye to do that, by the way. They're not using the image forming eyes here. They're using the the the, the uh, pineal body on the top of their head. So if you if you cover if you then cover the pineal body, then then they can't orient. You know, then they, they go off. They go off in random directions. You, there is I, I I came across a paper where you, there you put like plastic caps on the salamanders, right? And that was the case. That's pretty interesting. I, how does the the plastic caps? Were those specially made, I, or the, well, that was? They were just totally opaque pieces of film. Okay. Through which light would not pass, so it, it totally blocked out their ability to see the the light overhead. Yeah, that yeah, was that was our, our first major discovery was that these these animals could actually, you know, we knew about lizards, but nobody had looked at salamanders and frogs, so. Um, I was working with with uh, Plethodon glutinosus, the slimy salamander, in Virginia at the biological station, and and decided to do these experiments and put the film over the head, and um, and then they just were they were unable not only orientation but but they were unable to change their circadian rhythms. But the other thing we we discovered was that they can use this this. Uh, light receptor, the third eye, to, to cue their circadian rhythms. Let's say that you've got an animal that's used to having lights on at nine in the morning and lights off at three in the afternoon. But now you wanna, you wanna shift their clock, which you can do. So you can have the lights come on at, at six in the morning instead of nine in the morning. So that, that same period of, of uh, whatever it is, 12 hours, or no, no, it's uh, uh, six hours. You've moved that around and it's now at a, at a different time. So that's gonna change the direction of orientation. At least you would predict that it would. And actually you can do the experiment and sure enough, it does. So you can, you can shift an animal's internal clock just like I could shift you guys' clock. You know, if you decided you wanted to, if you wanted to be bird people, which means you'd have to get up much earlier in the morning to go out and see the birds, then we'd, we'd have to set, we'd have to change your, the clock. And so maybe for a couple of weeks, we'd change the alarms and the alarms mm -hmm. would come, go off at, at uh, I don't know what do bird people do, get up at four or five in the morning. And then after a while, you wouldn't have to put the alarms on because your internal clock would have been shifted. Okay, you see what I'm saying? You'd, you'd be automatically getting up at four or five in the morning because your internal physiological clock has been changed. So that's what we did with the salamanders. You can you can shift their clock. So these are there are all kinds of experiments that you can do to to to, to tease apart what's really going on and what the animals are doing in order to orient. So actually we. We went out to Arizona. I did a sabbatic out there to work on desert lizards. 
I worked on Yuma, you know, the fringe toad lizards, because these deserts are, are just pure sand. I mean, 40 miles of sand, maybe a bush here and there, and a, a bush there, not much, really hot, lots of sidewinders. I never saw a desert tortoise, unfortunately. I looked for them. Um, but uh, I wanted to go there because there are no landmarks. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful experimental situation because there are no trees. There are no, you know, nothing for the animals to use. And um, so I wanted to see if they were using their parietal eye, the third eye on a lizard's head. And, and in fact, they, they were. And I was also doing circadian and rhythm experiments with them to, to make sure that they had a, an internal clock, which I presume they did, but we were able to prove experimentally that they did. It's, it's, and one thing that's interesting is, um, as you've said, you've done a lot of work on amphibians, like on tiger salamanders or eastern newts, uh, their polarization sensitivity, and a lot of people have done them on fish. But I think what's interesting is that snakes are noticeably absent or perhaps mm -hmm. understudied. So would you say that they're not very good at orientation or are they simply just understudied animals? Now, what you're talking about, you said snakes? Yeah. I don't know of any data that show that, that snakes have a third eye. Snakes yeah, don't have a third right. eye. Uh, but salamanders, uh, uh, frogs, I don't know about Sicilians, I never looked at Sicilians. Uh, lizards, but not all lizards. There are a number of lizard families where, they're, where it's absent, but most lizards have them. Uh, you know, iguanid lizards uh, have them. And of course, the tuataras have them. Uh, turtles have a, a uh, some species of turtles, like the leatherback and so forth, have a, a clear area on the top of the skull that allows light in. I don't think that we know a whole lot more about it than that. So at least there, the opportunity is there. Somebody would have to do the experiments. How would you like to have to do experiments with an eight foot long turtle? You know, this is the pride. Let's a lot of turtles because of their huge size are, are not ideal experimental subjects for these kinds of experiments. Now, all our turtle species would be maybe door, desert tortoises and so forth. Um, but but snakes, I don't know of any snake that has any part of a of a parietal eye or or a, a, a photoreceptor on the top of their brain. And it may go back to the fact that their ancestors were subterranean. And so when they lived underground, uh, at least that's one of the ideas as to the origin of snakes is that a, it was a group of lizards that went underground lost their limbs uh, and maybe lost the uh, the third eye at the same time there seems right. to be and a lot of they don't yeah they don't seem to have magneto reception either which is to be expected because of how closely related polarization sensitivity is to magneto reception well magnetic reception you know that's a that's a different story um that's a that's a that's a very different cue to work with because humans don't have any consciously have uh, sensitivity to magnetic fields. Mm -hmm. We can see evidence of it in the laboratory or have a couple of magnets and, you know, you can play around with it. But, uh, you know, I mean, what does a magnetic field look like? At least with polarized lights, you can use some filters and move them. You take, you take two Polaroid filters and if the two are oriented this way, the light will pass, but then you turn one filter to 90 degrees, there's no light going through. It's completely black. So at least you can see with a little experimental devices like that, you can see that there's some polarized light, but magnetic fields are very difficult for us to conceive of. And we know really very little about how they're, how they're, uh, you know, the receptors for magnetic fields. The, uh, in fact, the, uh, I mean, I had worked with magnetic fields for a number of years just to try to show that amphibians could detect them, but it was actually two of my students. One of them was an undergraduate who did the first experiments showing that 
amphibians of any kind can detect the Earth's magnetic field. And that man's name, he's now a professor at Virginia Tech, John Phillips, and he did that as an undergraduate. And he worked, if you were gonna work, if you were gonna choose a species, okay, here's a question for you guys. Uh, if you're gonna choose a species to work on magnetic fields, orientation, what species might you pick ideally to do a test on magnetic fields. If you're gonna, you can pick any species of salamander. What species of salamander do you think you would pick? Eastern newts. Huh? Eastern newts. No, no, what he picked, what he picked was the cave salamander. Why? Oh yeah. Because they live mostly in darkness. And so if, the, if any salamander was going to have even the slightest sensitivity to the Earth's magnetic zeal, it ought to be a cave salamander because of the, of the habitat they live in. So we went down to a cave that I knew in Virginia and got some cave salamanders. And, but he did the research himself. And you can manufacture your own artificial magnetic field in the laboratory. By, by making what's called a Rubens cube coil. You, you take a, a box and, and you wrap it with so many turns of copper wires in this direction and that direction. And you create inside the box your own artificial magnetic field. And then you can move, you can move the axis of the field any, any direction you want by flipping switches. So you can test the animals inside that box. You have to train them first to the magnetic field and then you put them in the box and see, do they behave as if they can detect that magnetic field? And the answer was yes. And then the other student of mine was the first one to do it with reptiles. And this was Gordon Rada, um, who worked with alligators. And we knew that alligators can, can orient long distances. Think about all those nuisance alligators that the fish and wildlife people take out of somebody's backyard that they just ate somebody's dog and oh we're, we'll get rid of this alligator for you but they really just take it maybe a hundred miles away and of course the alligator often comes right back i mean alligators are very good at or at orienting and navigating and uh so gordon decided to pick the alligator and so he worked in the in the lakes region of northern florida for all of his doctoral work and uh, he used baby alligators. So, <laughs> I mean, you're not going to use full-grown alligators. So right. he used, used baby alligators. So he waited until the mother, you know, the mother makes a crash. You know, she has a little nursery there where she keeps all the little babies together for several years. And then she has to go away to feed occasionally. So Gordon would wait for the mother alligator to leave to go feed and he'd sneak in there and get some, get some baby alligators and then get out of there. And then he would go and do the test somewhere. And then after a few days, he would wait and put the babies back in the, in the nursery. And the, even as babies, these alligators were very good at orienting and they indeed could detect the earth's magnetic field. So people, I mean, of course, they've discovered this now in turtles and other reptiles. You would have thought the turtle people would have done this long before. Uh, Archie Carr should have done this a long time ago. He was so focused on odors. And the mistake he made was in thinking that a given species only uses one cue. So, you know, a bird will use the sun and a, and a, and a, and a turtle will use odors in the ocean and then a a snake will do this and a lizard will do that. No, it doesn't, doesn't work that way. Most species have multi-sensory systems. They use a whole variety of cues. So he never bothered to do the experiments. And, and of course, turtles are very uh, sensitive to the Earth's magnetic field. There was a cool paper that came out a few years ago, I think, and maybe more than a few years ago, but I recall reading that they, it was sort of an overview of what's known about it. It's surprisingly very little, right? That they can 
I think that they used that coil that you were talking about and, and sort of simulated di different magnetic fields and, and showed that loggerheads, at least hatchlings, can orient. But mm -hmm. then, right, when you were saying that we don't know much about this, I, I think that they're the properties of it, like, I think that the inclination and then you could also have an intensity of the field and that, but that varies. It, uh, I think like inclination would vary latitudinally and then, but maybe there's a less variation in like how they would use that information in, ter in terms of navigation is pretty interesting. It seems like kind of an open question, but hard, like hard to test, not in a controlled manner. Right. So that becomes, how are they using this? Well, it's, it's, most of the work has been done in laboratories somewhere because you've got to be able to manipulate uh, or create a new magnetic field. It's very difficult to do those experiments outdoors. Now, what the bird people have done is what they do, they'll, they'll quite often um, have two groups of animals. And on one group, the experimental group, they'll put a, put a magnet right on the back of the neck of the bird which will dis disrupt the, the, the magnetic field around the head of the bird. And then on the control birds, they just put a little metal piece that weighs as much as the magnet weighed. So, okay, it's got the same weight and same size, but it's not magnetic. And then you look at the differences in, in the behavior of the two groups of birds. And you do find that the ones that have had their magnetic field disrupted uh, can't orient uh, normally so I mean you, you can do field experiments but they're not they're not simple and then you want to you want to be able to follow the bird so I had a colleague here at Cornell who actually was a pilot so he'd go up and they'd release birds and then he'd follow single a single bird he'd follow it in his plane because they wouldn't often go in a straight line go off and he wanted to know what the actual path was and sometimes they'd go and they'd sit in a tree somewhere for a half an hour. And so Charlie would be, you know, buzzing his plane around, waiting for that bird to take off. <laughs> Finally, it would take off. So it was, it, it was a very labor-intensive and rather expensive kind of research to do. It's not, it's not for the weak of heart. So, uh, but you could do experiments like that with turtles. I mean, you can certainly put magnets on turtles' heads and then release them out and, you know, sea turtles and uh, and see how they do. But, of course, you're dealing with, in many cases, endangered species. And you'd have to get you'd have to get permission from wherever in order to do those kinds of experiments, because when you start messing with a turtle's ability to orient, maybe they can't orient. They can't find the I'm just supposing they can't find the nesting beach. So they, they lose out a whole year of, of reproduction. You know, and maybe that's not a good thing for an endangered species. So, you know, you, you, you have to be sensitive to these other issues. You can't just go out and do what you want to do. And you have to follow the rules and regulations, uh, not just because it's the right thing to do, but you won't be able to get your research published. I mean, if you send a paper in, to a, to a scientific, if I were to send a, a paper on animal behavior into a, any, any respectable journal, if I don't have a statement in there that this project has been examined by what's called the IACUC committee, and every major research university has one, it's a group of peers, and they go over your research with a fine tooth comb. You know, how many animals are you going to use? Well, why do you need that many? Maybe you could cut it in half and still get the same results. What kind of statistics are you going to use? How are they going to be fed? You know, all of these questions. And if you don't pass the IACUC committee, they won't approve your research. And if you submit a paper to a respectable journal with, with, your, with your, you don't have permission from your IACUC committee, they won't publish it. Now, you can, you can find journals that will publish things like that but they're not the kind of journals you want to publish papers in. So, you know, there are these, these legal restrictions too. So to make sure that people are doing the right thing. Right. I think I guess another challenge of one of these, uh, some of these experimental studies is, is also isolating exactly what mechanism is behind, you know, the navigation that you're seeing, because it's not just magnetic or polarization. They, 
some frogs they can look at like four four silhouettes, right? And or they they might use smells. So that's that's another thing that's hard to control for. And you've mentioned that you've had also a background in like systematics and taxonomy. So I was wondering, like, what is our understanding of the evolution of um, different, I guess, mechanics behind the polarization sensitivity or magnetoreception? I I haven't, you know, I've ultimately it would be wonderful to do a comparative study to answer the kind of question you're getting at here, which is to find out, you know, among say the families of salamanders, um, which salamanders use the Earth's magnetic field and which ones do not. There may there may be some that that don't. Um, I don't know. We don't have enough data on enough species and, and enough families to be able to answer that. So I, I, I wouldn't even want to speculate what you might find. So what we've simply been able to do is demonstrate that some salamander and maybe other salamanders by implication can detect polarized light. They use circadian rhythms. They, they integrate this information, et cetera, et cetera. And you can show how they, you can do it through experimental uh, setups. Um, but, uh, you know, we know that not all, all, all uh, reptiles have the same sensory apparatus. As you said earlier, snakes don't have some of these structures. Um, so um, so they, they aren't using those kinds of mechanisms. Um, but we just, we just don't have enough information on enough families. I was once going to do a study on on electroreception in salamanders. I was very interested. I'd done some experiments here at Cornell on whether salamanders can detect electric fields and presumably maybe use it for communication or what have you. And so we have lots of salamanders in New York. We have five, sal five families of salamanders. We have um, the hellbender. We have uh, the mud puppy. We have salamandrids, ambistomatids, and plethodonids. But we don't have sirens and we don't have amphiuma, and those were key. So I needed to go to Florida, and I was all set to go to Florida. I had my cabin reserved at at, um, at the uh, uh, biological station there, and then I I got into an administrative job at Cornell, and they asked me to to be vice provost for a while, and so I did that. So I never got to do that, but it turns out those salamanders can detect electric fields but um i i my my position my supposition but the key was the amphiuma because the amphiuma the ancestors of the amphiuma were per, apparently terrestrial and they have secondarily gone back into water so that was that was a that was key because they're not totally they were not they're not currently totally terrestrial so so I was going to do a comparative study, and I got it part way done, and I didn't. I didn't get to Florida to do the experiments with those two very important families of salamanders, and so the the, the research never got published. So I still, it's like every everybody my age has unfinished research sitting in a file in their file cabinets that uh, has been sitting there and just didn't get completed for one reason or another. Something else came up, and and uh, and uh, they couldn't finish it. Sometimes you you hand it off to a student, and you say, "Okay, here's we've got some preliminary data. You know, if this interests you, you might want to do this." And so sometimes a student will take it over. Um, but uh, I, I'm I won't be getting getting back to it. Somebody else will will have to finish that sort of study. But that was the idea was to do a comparative study to answer the kind of question can that you were you were getting at which interests me a lot right. um, but it takes a whole lot more work and you often have to you have to go to where the animals are from, you know whatever the key species are that you need for your phylogenetic pattern and and um, and sometimes that's not so simple and, and other things come up in your life and and uh, and do something very different and and then you don't go back to the work that you started it's unfortunate, but everybody has file cabinets full of 
full of unfinished projects. I mean, just ask a few, just ask a few professors, uh, and I, I think you'll you'll find that. Uh, uh, I mean, you're working with Todd uh, Pearson, right? That's right. Yeah. And I'll bet he has. I'll bet he's got files in his file cabinet of research that that he hasn't finished, and and whether he ever gets back to it, who knows? I mean, it, this is just n normal um, in in academia. You just you just start things, and other things come along that you think are more important. And you say, okay, I'll put that one aside for just a short time. I'm going to do this, and then time moves on, and you never get back to the one you started. It's too bad, but. That's just the way life is sometimes. Yeah, and this, I was going to return to an earlier topic with yep. the magneto reception in sea turtles. And this is honestly kind of a simple question. There has to be like a physical part or a mechanical aspect in the brain and even in salamanders too that is responsible for that ability. Like, is, that, is there any, been any research like trying to find that or? like through a dissection of the brain or like understanding the different parts, there's got to be something that they, that gives them that ability. I've heard all kinds of theories out there, but I don't know anything for certain. Like, uh, in, in turtles, I don't know of anything like the, that that's been determined on, on the actual anatomical basis for magneto reception. Um, in some other organisms, it's, 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 it's pretty well understood in bacteria. We know, for example, how it's done in birds, uh, but, but uh, one of the ideas at the moment is that, they, that the photoreceptors in the eyes also serve as magnetoreceptors because of the way the, the, the electrons move from one energy state to another and how this is affected by the Earth's magnetic field. And so uh, that these photoreceptors uh, in the in the rods and cones are somehow also doubling as magnetoreceptors, and I've never done any of that kind of research, so I, I really can't tell you much more about it than that. But uh, uh, but it's it's obviously not very simple research to do because somebody would have done it by now, and uh, I, I don't know of any convincing evidence, and and for herps, uh, I don't know of any evidence. That's, that I would regard as convinced. I mean, now maybe it's out there, and I just haven't seen seen the research papers, but I don't know of any. I've heard the magnetite hypothesis for yeah. sea turtles, but like you said, I think that that might just be the fact that we don't actually have any other evidence. We're going to use that theory based on other studies and different organisms. I don't think it's a good principle to go by. Well, it's a very it's a very simple minded one, uh, and, and it's easy to imagine. But and, and actually, in bacteria, it may actually be the mechanism that they use. Now, there's no reason to believe that the mechanism in all animals and organisms right. be the same. So, at least in in bacteria, magnetite apparently is involved. And so, that caused this was a number of years ago. That caused all the bird people to start studying magnetite. And I don't think anything came out of that at all. People studied it for years here in the U.S. and in Germany and Italy. And uh, I don't think anything productive came out of it. So ne negative results. So it, it, it's not a simple, whatever it is, it's not a simple mechanism involving magnetite. But the bag, you know, the bacteria are really wonderful. You, you can look at them. I've seen, people have shown these to me. You look under the microscope at, a, at, you know, thousands of bacteria. And here they all are, you know, they're, they're moving around. And, and you've got this, one of these artificial uh, magnetic coils over it. So you can shift the magnetic field around your microscope. And then with the flipping the switches, you can turn the axis of the magnetic field. And you look at the bacteria and you turn on, turn on the magnetic field and all the bacteria, thousands of them are all going in this direction. And then you flip the switch and they and the bacteria go off in another direction. I mean, you know, it's like a like a huge herd of cattle. And then it, I mean, it, just, it was amazing to see how, how the I mean, a very dramatic shift in their orientation. Now, maybe they're all following one bacteria that knows how to do it. 
I don't know. But uh, probably they're all detecting, all of the bacterial cells are detecting it. And, and, and the mechanism presumably involves magnetite. So, so I, there... wish it, wish it were so simple in herbs, but it's not. I suppose I suppose you could say there's like three main uh, theories. You know, first one, like as we mentioned, would be mechanical reception, like based on magnetites in, in the in the head. Or you have, you know, electric induction, which I think was a pretty prominent idea for fish and especially like elasmobranchs. And you have mm -hmm. chemical reception, which is I guess to my to my at least my gut feeling, I feel like chemical reception would be a pretty good idea for birds or salamanders just because of how uh, magnetic reception is coupled with photoreception, right? Because using the chemical reception hypothesis, uh, it's, it's an idea based on like electron spin or like rad, um, radical pair electron theory. And that would help, I guess, couple the uh, photoreception with the magnetic magnetic field. Of course, I have to be careful when I say this, especially with you here. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've never, I've, I've done just a few little experiments on odors. Odors are very difficult to work with because, you know, it, it's, it's like the magnetic field. You, you can't see it. I mean, okay, you can put some smoke in there and you can, you can see where the, which way the wind's blowing and taking your odors. But but just sorting out the odors and, and the odors in the, in the, in the natural world are so complicated. You know, I mean, a salamander living at ground level in a pond, the, the odors they're exposed to, and then maybe the odor from, from the woods, maybe the woods smell different than the pond. And so they, uh, they can figure out which way to go to get to the woods. Uh, but it's gotta be more than that because they don't just go to any woods. They go to the same woods where they live year after year after year. And when they go to the pond, they don't just go to any pond. They go to a specific pond. I remember uh, working with, this wasn't my ex work, but I was helping somebody in the field with their own work on salamander orientation in, in when I was in graduate school. And they had fences around the, the ponds, you know, drift fences. So you could see who was going in and who was coming out. Okay. And so the salamanders in the spring, they would start heading to the, to the ponds and you knew which salamander would normally breed in which pond. And there were a whole bunch of ponds. And some of those salamanders would come to the fence of a different pond, not its actual pond where it normally would breed. And it would go in the pond go to the other side of the pond, get out of the pond, and then still keep going towards their normal pond. So the point was, they're not just going to any pond. So it isn't just the smell of, you know, whatever a, a spring pond smells like in Ann Arbor, Michigan. They were going to a very particular place, and my guess is that was the pond they were born in. These animals go back to their natal ponds. And I, I used to have an argument with this one guy in Maryland that he was working on, on newt uh, orientation. And, and I was saying, you know, um, I, he said, their movements seem to be random. They'll just, they'll go to any pond. I said, I said, but not for breeding purposes. I said, I'll bet you they're only going to go to their breeding pond, to their natal pond, okay? Well, it takes a while to answer that question because newts take several years, five to seven years to become sexually mature. So this is not a good animal to choose for your experiments. But anyway, it was the one to get chosen. And so I, but I said, I predict that you, you wait seven years or five or whatever it is. And then I said, and when they go back to breed now, that they will go to their natal pond, and that's exactly where they went. I mean, not every single one. Of course, you know, we're dealing with biology here. This is not physics, you know, where, th where things are very precise. Organisms are not precise. Organisms are, you know, each one is genetically a little different. Their, their development was different. I mean, biology is the science of variability. And, and you, and a biologist has to, 
do experiments where they can re hopefully reduce the, the variability sufficiently that they can pick out the signal from all the noise. You know, and in physics, you know, you do an experiment over and over again, and you're going to get virtually the same result unless you, you know, you goof, you goof up. You're going to get the same measurements. You're going to, you know, it's, you know, dropping a ball and, and doing some experiments in physics. It's pretty straightforward. It's not that way in biology. And it's, it, it's the nature of the beast, you know, except for identical twins. And even with identical twins, you know, we know they're they raised and, you know, you hear these stories of uh, kids uh, from one country that came over as orphans and they, one kid was raised here and the other twin was raised there. And then 20 years later, you look at them and, oh, they're different people. And I, but they're genetically identical. They're identi identical twins, not fraternal twins, identical twins. So, so the environment that you are exposed to and that you're raised in has an impact on, a, on, a, on a humans or presumably these, the animals, an impact on their behavior later on. So biology is just is, is one of the problems you have in doing experiments is dealing with all the variability. And this is why you really have to understand statistics. Why having a, a statistical sense because that allows you to, you know, use various mathematical devices for sorting out the signal from all the noise. And, uh, and uh, so be sure when you go to college or certainly at the graduate level, take a course in, in biological statistics. It's, it's really important uh, to do any kind of, certainly by uh, experimental research, but even non-experimental research, you know? You're comparing the bones, the bone length of a frog's femur or something, and in a whole population of frogs, they're they're not all going to be the same. And and you want to say, well, what is it in this species compared to that species? Because there might be a difference. So you got to do you got to use statistics for that as well, even though that's not experimental biology. So statistics is 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 one of those courses you really need to have. Uh, uh, certainly by the time you get to graduate school. Or take it in. It's better to take it in graduate school because you're going to be doing your own research and you're going to be motivated to use statistics. And so it'll make the course more meaningful for you because you can use some of your own data. You don't have to use somebody else's made or made up data. You can use your own experimental data. So um, put that put that on your bucket list for grad school. OK. It's pretty fun too when you finally get something to work. I've been, I've been working on using different analyses for the the pond turtle work I'm doing, and I'm still kind of in the process of like every time you do an analysis, you say, "Oh, I could actually do this if I played with the variables a little bit." And it's been like you struggle through it, but at a certain point, it's like, "Yes, okay, the, <laughs> the model has worked." So it it's yeah, but I mean, it makes sense, right? In in high school. I've, I've been through some stats courses and a lot of people are not motivated whatsoever, but I'm just like, I mean, I'm, I'm enjoying this cause I've got a reason I'm doing it. So it, exactly. it definitely helps that's a lot. Point. Yeah. Yeah. But that's pretty interesting. I, the, uh, the natal homing of the salamanders is something I, I haven't thought about. There was a study uh, by Whit Gibbons and I think Rebecca Yeomans in 1995 that looked at, sliders and how they can actually the slider turtles when you put them in an area where a, a foreign area to the turtles you translocate them from there where they were found you put them on a hill where they can't see water they can actually find the water uh non-randomly uh again with the stats but it's interesting to think maybe there would be some way to control for if that was their home pond if there was a difference in how they this, this is one of the most difficult problems. Anytime you're working on doing a homing experiments like that in the field, you do not normally do not know where that animal has been before. Right. Yes. Yeah. You don't know if that turtle has has already been in that pond before. And if you're if you're using adult turtles, you know they're long lived animals. They can do a lot of moving. I mean, look at newts, for example. What, what do newts do? The eastern newt. It's hatched out in the pond. 
It leaves the pond, becomes an eft, and then it wanders around in the forest for five to seven years while it becomes sexually mature. So what's it, what's it doing? I mean, is it, is it is just going, spending five to seven years uh, uh, growing up and putting on fat and, and so forth and so on? Other salamanders mature much faster than that. I think what they're doing is, is they're, they're learning the landscape out there. Now, they're still going to go back to their natal pond. But if you think about it evolutionarily, you know, ponds dry up. It might be good to have a backup pond in mind because the newts are only going to breed for a couple of years. The eastern newt only breeds for a couple of years. It's not like the, the western newts, which, which have greater longevity. So they can't mess around, so to speak. Uh, at least the ones that are going to survive. If their if their natal pond has dried up for some reason, you know the females laden with a, with eggs and and she's ready to breed. Well, she can resorb them, uh, maybe use them the next year. But the newts only reproduce the eastern newt maybe two years. That's it. So it's it's awfully important if you think about it from the strategy of the newt. They've got to find. What is their best shot at finding a pond that will be an acceptable pond to reproduce in? What pond would that be? Their natal pond. They, they, you know, they know in a sense, no, because of the experience that that pond was successful because they were born there and pretty recently. But even the natal pond might be dried up. So they, they've got to have some knowledge of some other place where the female can drop those eggs and not waste a whole reproductive season, which might be 50% of her reproductive capacity for her lifetime. So obviously they don't know, but it's, it's, the point is those that have the strategy and it's a successful strategy are the ones that are going to survive and pass their genes on. Those that are not successful, don't, they don't have a backup pond etc. Those newts are not so likely to live and, and survive and contribute to the gene pool of the next generation. So uh, I think those new, those Fs are out there, you know, they're learning. And I think some, one of the things, uh, Ken, that they're learning, they're learning the magnetic field of the whole area. And they're learning and the, the, the comments that Michael was making about the inclination, you know, the, the magnetic field, you can subdivide it into different components, you know, that the physicists would divide it into. And so maybe the animals are actually detecting these different components. We think they probably are. But they, you know, but maybe they're going around and they're comparing, okay, they, they measured the various magnetic components that they're at their natal pond because that's where they were from but now they have to compare it to the rest of the woods and then the, the woods down the way and maybe 10 miles over there they've got plenty of time you say oh gosh 10 miles that's a long distance for a little tiny animal they've got plenty of time they've got five to seven years they can they can easily get to that that they can cover a huge area not that they're going to live there you know, as adults, but at least they, they get some idea of what the what the com the magnetic components are as they move, you know. So a newt's moving in this direction. So is the inclination getting greater as I move in that direction? What happens if I, if I move in this direction? You know, I think my, my guess is that they're learning these things while they're growing up, and then they use them to go back and find their natal pond. I mean, think about it. If, if you had to find your natal, you know, where you were born without any signs or any other devices, and you were going to have to find it, um, and, and you're wandering around, think of all the information you'd have to integrate to find your way back there. Uh, it's, it's, it would be a very complicated task to do. You know, well, I moved, today I moved, so many feet in this, you know, such and such a compass direction. And then the next day you move that way a little bit. Next, 
And then at the end of five years, you have to integrate all this information and say, ah, therefore, I solved my mathematical problem. So the way back to my natal pond is to go that direction over there. I don't think so. I think what they're doing is they're, they're learning the comp they're learning the parameters of the magnetic field such that they know what the parameters of the inclination and the other components are in the natal pond. And then when it's time for them to reproduce, they can figure out a pretty direct route from wherever they are to their natal pond because they have this mental magnetic map in their head somewhere, I presume. That's my it, guess. Okay. It, it, it gets kind of an interesting way, way to think about math. Huh? I, I think when you, th well, like thinking about math, right? We tend to think about those parameters of different fields as things that need to be solved, but maybe we're just trying to understand the conscious of other, it, it's sort of a philosophical thing. Is like may, maybe mathematics to some extent is just trying to understand the conscious of other organisms. It gives you kind of an interesting. It, I'm sure that a philosopher could rip apart that, but there's just something there, right? Is maybe we're just trying to solve for a different sort of understanding. We have to. I'd say you have to compensate for our own limitations, like things we're not able to and not able to pick up on and we have to understand that i mean that, that's just a basic basic human nature well yeah that's a that's a that's a good point and and part of our restrictions in doing all kinds of experiments is we're limited by what we know and and quite often the animals are doing something beyond our comprehension or that we just i mean I remember back in the in the 50s when when they were trying to understand how honeybees, you know, do they use the Earth's magnetic field or, or not? And for actually one of von Frisch's graduate students, who was my colleague at Notre Dame, he went to Professor, Herr Professor Dr. von Frisch and said, I want to do these these experiments on the magnetic field with the honeybees. And von Frisch, who was a brilliant scientist, Nobel laureate, he says to him, oh, Harold, in German, of course, but he says, Harold, uh, don't do that experiment. The Earth's magnetic field is so weak, there is no way that an animal could detect it. This was part of our mental block and why people didn't do experiments on magnetic fields, because the Earth's magnetic field is about a half a gauss, which is you know, really trivial. And and the idea that a honeybee or a salamander could detect it was was so remote that even the great Professor von Frisch said, Harold, don't bother doing the experiment. Well, we now know honeybees can detect the Earth's magnetic field. Thank you very much. The honeybees did not read Dr. von Frisch's book that they don't do this. And so, in fact, they do do it. And, but nobody, until more recently, actually went out and did the experiment. So you, just, you can't sit in a chair and, and <clears throat> decide what animals can and can't do. You got to go in the lab. You got to go out in the field, devise the experiments, ask the animals through an experiment what they can do and what they can't do. So the, the, my point is the, the limitation for us as humans is often our own brains and our own sense of possibilities. And these many of these animal lineages, they've been on this planet a lot longer than we have. So, you know, and they're very highly adapted to the, to the life that they lead. And they're very good at things. And their, their sensitivities to the magnetic field is beyond what anyone thought an animal could do until fairly recently. So, you know, this, this is where it, it becomes a real, uh, you know, philosophical, as Michael was saying, problem or not, uh, because it, it's hard to conceive of certain things. So some of these experiments are very hard to do because you can't, you, we humans have no sense of what a magnetic field feels like or looks like. Uh, you know, polarization, we could get us some sense. I mean, you know, other cues we, we know a lot about, but odors we know 
we're complicated, but at least we can understand odors as cues. But some of the other cues are not so simple. Electric cues. I can understand those. I wish I had an electric catfish in my lab for a while years ago. And I made the mistake of putting my head in that water. And I, and I pissed off the, the fish for some reason. And, and man, he did a, an electric discharge. And whoa, it was, it was like, if you, you ever gotten a shock off of a lamp, it's got a short in it, you know? And you really it feel, you, it just goes through your body. And this was a small catfish. And you know, in the, in, this is from the Nile River. And they get to be six feet long. So I thought, thank God I had a small one because <laughs> a big one could have killed me. But, uh, you know, so you can get a sense of an electric. My point is you can, we can have a sense of an electrical discharge just from being careless like I was. That's pretty interesting. I think that it's probably, uh, we're coming up on time, but it, it definitely, I think that ends on a good, the discussion there sort of on an interesting note, philosophical, scientific, a lot of different things to chew on. Um, we typically do a little bit of trivia at the end, but I think maybe what we we can still do that, but maybe instead of doing like cold hard facts, we can do a little volley. It, it, Dr. Adler, if you want to ask us just random, obscure reptile facts, that's fine. But maybe for us, we could do some rapid fire just basic questions about like your most interesting experience, that kind of thing, if that works. Okay. But before we do, I mean, you had some questions on here that we didn't even get to. Well, yeah. What I mean, that, do that happens. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it happens. Like, well, well, we could do sometime, maybe sometime in the, in the future, we could return to that. I don't or... know which one of you thought of this one, but who was Theodore Cantor? Well, yeah, that, I was curious about that because, uh, yeah, maybe we could we could just ask some of the ones we've got on there, I guess. I mean, it's funny you should ask because because SSAR just a few years ago published. Oh, there you go. <laughs> okay. So he was a he was a he was from Denmark. He was a physician, but he worked for the British East India Company. So he lived most of his life in Calcutta. And his main claim to fame was he's the one who discovered and described the king cobra. Ophiophagus, Hannah. Hannah. For years, we've been trying to figure out what is well, Hannah? What does that mean? It's a person's name. Yeah, it's his cousin's name. He stayed with his cousin, his uncle in Calcutta. People didn't notice that. And her name was Hannah. Anyway, so he discovered the king cobra. Well, then you've heard of the opium wars. And so suddenly England was at war with China. And so they were sending a whole fleet of ships, uh, HMS Rattlesnake and a bunch of interesting ships. And they were sending them up the coast in 1840. And Cantor said, can I go along? He saw an opportunity because no trained European trained scientist, zoologist had ever been to China before. And he knew, boy, if I can get into China, I could make some collections. And so they did. He went on, on one of the on one of the battleships, gun one of the gunboats. And so he went up to a little island called Shuzan. That's this the Zoali of Chusan is the island south of Shanghai. And of course, if you're the first guy that's there, almost everything you see is a new species, right? Well, he wasn't there very long. So he got, he got 10 species of herps, one toad and the rest were all reptiles. And I think seven out of the 10 were new species, including one beautiful turtle. Can you see it here? Shifted over just a there bit. we go, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, we can see it. This, yeah. There it is. You know what that is? That's Moremi's Mutica. Oh. Moremi's Mutica. And this is the original description of, of that turtle. And But he, just, he, he discovered new snakes, new lizards, etc. And then he fell sick with, with uh, malaria and they had to ship him back to 
to, to Calcutta. And that's the story of Theodore Cantor. So whose idea was that question? Well, I, so in the, in the process of kind of going through the, the, the publications and such, I came across that book and I, so Pella Kelly's Cantor Eyes, another soft shell yeah. that's named after him. So I, I said, well, that might be an interesting thing to bring up, but who knew? I, I didn't realize that he discovered the King Cobra. He's named for him. Yep. Yep. But he was a, a real pioneer and uh, uh, did, you know, these collections in China. But then he also spent uh, sort of the second half of his life in the, in the Malay Peninsula. He was made director of a group of hospitals in Penang, an island off the coast of Malaysia. And of course, there's another area that, that just was just all sorts of new species were crawling around in the forests and so he described uh, dozens of new species from there. So, you know, it helps to be first <laughs> into, a, into a new area. And uh, so he got lucky twice, once in China and the other time in, in Malaya. So, uh, but most young people today don't, don't think of him except to see his name in a scientific name. But, uh, but his real uh, major discovery that people do know about is the discovery of the King Cobra. He, he caught two large specimens and and described it in a paper. Um, two big ones. <laughs> so, I mean, can you imagine going out in the field and collecting king cobras? Yeah, especially back then, that must have been kind of crazy. Mean, been in the field in in areas where there are king cobras, and boy, I can tell you, they were on my mind every second. <laughs> I never saw one. In, in the field. But I have friends who've worked out in the field who have seen King Cobras. My friend in Indri Neil Das uh, was walking down a, a stream working on frogs. And on the other side of the stream, the stream's only about a half a foot deep. Here's a big King Cobra following him. And I mean, he said it was about 12 feet long and, you know, raised up off the ground. And so Indra Neal would walk about 10 feet and then the cobra would come along about 10 feet and then he'd move again. And the cobra would, I mean, clearly that cobra was, had all its attention on my friend. And he said, there was no place to escape. He said, if that snake wanted to go across that stream, he said, that snake would be over there in a flash. <laughs> and so it was, uh, it, it got his attention. Let me tell you. So I've not I've not had that experience. I mean, I might have been in a place where a cobra saw me, but I didn't see it. That's always I, a possibility. You never know. Well, I've, I, I've got a, yeah, but not cobras. I've got a question just about what your most kind of the, the the memory in the field that stands out to you the most. What was the most interesting? Oh, there have been a number of those. I guess the one that was most exciting was when South America, when in Colombia, when I was down there looking for uh, marsupial frogs. And we were in dugout canoes going down the Rio Sanu, which is a river that comes off the Caribbean and goes essentially parallel to the Panamanian border in, in Colombia. And it's a remote area but that most people have not gone to. And so we got into areas where the, the Emberon Indians lived. I mean, the really primitive tribes of people. And, uh, but it was a, you know, they, they decked out, the women would be decked out in all their finery. And they had, I mean, gold earrings and, you know, all kinds of things. And, uh, and they did most of their hunting with bow and arrow and, and actually mostly by blowgun. And so it was very interesting to have them demonstrate they were really good. And they would make those blowguns and think how smooth the bore has to be in a blowgun in order to work properly. You, you can't have a little bend or a, a, a little obstruction in there. You have to make sure that it's a clean, you know, these, these blowguns were, gosh, they were taller than they were, but they were short. So. I would imagine some of these were six, eight feet long, but to have a, you know, to take a plant, a, 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 you have to find a straight 
piece of, of, of um, limb of a tree of some sort, hollow it out and make it smooth enough that you could put your blowgun dart in there. And so that with a, you know, a puff of your, of your lungs, you could get that dart out of there and, and get a monkey or something up in the trees. I mean, they're very skilled people. It was, it was very exciting to see them. And uh, they had actually been at war when we were there which made it a little touchy because they were at war with the Spanish speaking people in the little town down the river. And uh, we didn't want to get in the middle of their, of their war, but going along the Rio Sanu in our dugout canoes, we saw caiman, you know, full grown caiman just sitting over there, sunning on the, on the bank. There were some turtles, probably trichemis, um, you know, basking on, on logs. But the most exciting one were these giant river otters, which are multiple times the size of otters in North America, just swimming around, having fun, playing in the mud on the side of the of the stream over there. I mean, you know, and when you're in the canoe, I think it would be very different than if I were standing on the on the bank where the otters were. I think they would take notice of us and 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 maybe flee. But when we were in the boat, maybe they just, they just thought, well, that must be a big log floating down the river. I, I don't know what they thought of us, but they didn't seem to pay any attention to us. I mean, we didn't clap our hands or anything to draw attention to us, but it was pretty exciting to, to see wildlife that large. You know, I mean, the caiman were, you know, eight feet long, maybe. Uh, they were quite common there, I was sunning on the beach and or on, the, on the bank. Uh, so that was pretty exciting and I didn't see them, but this is where, you know, that famous poison arrow frog is from the phyllobates, uh, what is it? Uh, terribilis or horribilis, the most, the most poisonous animal in the world is this. And even if you touch them, you can take up enough of the poison through the skin to kill you. So, in fact, some of the people who worked on them, uh, um, they have to wear rubber gloves. And even then, sometimes there's enough in the air that it can cause you to faint. So um, we didn't see any of those. But this is the area where they discovered this this uh, world's most venomous frog, most poisonous frog. But uh, that's the, what's, it, what's it called? The golden, golden arrow frog, I think. Phyllobates terribilis. That sounds yeah. I think that that's the common name. So we missed that, but uh, but it was that was an exciting trip. But you know, other exciting things. We had an exciting meeting in Mexico, in Veracruz. It was run by Dick Vogt. You know that name. He's a he's a card carrying turtle uh, herpetologist, and took over a, an old hotel, and so the. The whole thing was just everybody at the at the meeting. SSAR had planned this for over 10 years and we wanted to have a meeting in Mexico. So Dick was per perfect. He was he had a different musical band for us playing live music every night. We had great food every night. I mean, it was a, it was a total experience. But but here's the turtle part. So this was an, an, an old hacienda. And there were two swimming pools. And in the larger swimming pool, it was totally filled with turtles. <laughs> and I mean, you know, trachemes, uh, starotypus, dermatemes, uh, et cetera. You know, essentially all the turtles uh, from Central America that he could. And uh, so that was pretty exciting. They'd come up to the surface and you'd give them some food and so forth. But in the other pool, the other uh, pool in this was uh, they took all the water out and they filled it with bottles of beer. <laughs> <laughs> These are her now. So, and what Dick did, this was brilliant. And there were actually some steps that went down one side so you could walk down into the, into the pool. So what he did was he put a layer of ice and then a layer of bottles of beer 
another layer of ice, beer, ice, beer, ice, all the way to the top of the pool. I'm not exaggerating. The entire pool. And I don't know how he calculated this, but we were drinking the last beer on the last day. Now you have to just think of the calculations you have to do there for the number of people and who would drink beer. Anyway, it was perfect. The, and the ice, the ice stayed, it kept the beer cold for the whole week that we were there. But people, I mean, if you ask people about the Veracruz meeting, they probably won't be able to tell you about any of the scientific papers, but they'll remember the turtles in the one pool and they'll remember the beer in the other pool. So you ask him, that was in 1987. And there are a lot of people around today who were at that meeting. That was one of the, the great herb meetings of all time. We did lots of other things. We went out in the field afterwards. I saw Xenosaurus in the field for the first time and only time I've ever seen them. And other people went on turtle trips and other people went on snake trips. So, we, you know, we split up the group and I, I forget how many groups there were, but uh, our group uh, saw Xenosara, so that was that was exciting. In the, in the middle of a coffee plantation, back in these little rock outcrops, and you'd look back in there and you'd see these two eyes just looking right, you know, the, those eyes on a Xenosara are kind of facing forward. And, and you look back in there and you see the eye. I didn't know what it was at first. I thought, what the heck is that? And then, of course, you tease them out. They bite like the Dickens. Um, but then it's a, it's a Xenosaurus, you know, about a foot long. It was, that was pretty exciting. And, you know, that's a monotypic family, Xenosauridae. So it's, uh, that was pretty exciting. I, I, I'm sure I'll never see one of those in the field again. So, so that was, that was a pretty good trip. Okay, that's, that's, that sounds like an adventure right there. Uh, <laughs> any, anything that, any, was, any story that involves Dick Vogt is, is, is going to be interesting. <laughs> Now, you know, the World Congress, the next World Congress coming up is in Borneo. Now, there's a place people would like, herpetologists would like to go, right? So there's going to be a World Congress there in, what, a couple of years? And, uh, in fact, Andrew, Andrew Neil Das is, is the, the, or, the overall organizer. So I'm, I'm sure there are going to be a lot of people who will go just so they have the opportunity you know, they'll hear the, the papers, but what they really want to see is Borneo and going out into the field and, and seeing flying lizards and maybe catch a glimpse of a king cobra. And, you know, I mean, Borneo is, I mean, I mean, think of Lanthanotis. If you could be so lucky as to see a Lanthanotis, I mean, Borneo has got some really interesting things and some interesting turtles, crocodilians, you know, the false gharial is there. Um, that would be a nice, they've got a freshwater crocodile there, an endemic species. So I don't know if I'm up to a trip to Borneo at my age, but uh, I hope a lot of young people will go. Because when are you going to get another chance to go to Borneo? Yeah, exactly. We'll have to keep that on our radars. That sounds yeah. like a fun yeah, trip. If, you got a bucket, if you're a herpetologist and you've got a bucket list, Borneo should be on there somewhere. What are your what are your chances? So I mean, I went to Australia. I mean, I'm a salamander person. What are my chances to go to Australia, being a salamander person? Zero, <laughs> zero. So when the World Congress was in Australia, you better believe I went to that Congress. <laughs> so I I could see the monitor lizards and and all the elapids out in the field, and oh boy, that was that was really quite something. And there's no substitute for actually seeing a, a place like that in the flesh, see the animals, see the habitat and, uh, and experience it, the temperatures, you know, and so forth. It was, it was wonderful. And, and the, the post-Congress uh, trips were, were great, just great. And nobody got killed. You know, That's always people, good. the last day of the conference, they showed motion pictures of saltwater crocodiles where they were feeding these crocodiles off of the second level of a boat in the river in northern Australia. They would take a fish and put it on a pole up on the second level. 
And these crocodiles were coming up and coming completely out of the water. Maybe the last six inches of their tail tip was still in the water. That entire crocodile had erupted and it was quite, you know, the water, the water is perfectly calm. And you think, well, what's going on here? And then all of a sudden, it's like an explosion. Water's, water's splashing all over the place. And up out of the water, here's this crocodile with its mouth open coming up to get that piece of fish. And you should have heard the audience. There was this huge gasp in the audience. The people thought, oh, my God, you know, I'm, go I'm going to this place next week. You know, and that was why they showed the movie. You know, be careful. When you're in Australia, you better be careful because, uh, you know, if it isn't a crocodile, you know, there are lapids. I had encounters with quite a few lapids and they're, they're quite aggressive. I had a tiger snake chasing me for a while. You know, wherever I would move, it would turn and take, kept coming right. And I was out in the middle of nothing. You know, it was trying, it was coming towards me. I, that was a little nerve wracking, you know. There was no place I could go except to, you know, move faster than the snake, which I did. But, you know, I've, I've never been, I've never been, you know, rattlesnakes don't chase you. You know, then we just want to be left alone. Well, these, these lapids are, are, they're different. They have a different attitude down there in Australia. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. And the herb meetings, you know, they're worth, I know they're expensive to go. But, you know, if you plan on far enough ahead and you start saving up money and and so forth, these these things become possible. So and sometimes we have student travel awards and and, uh, you know, there are other ways to to get to these meetings. But um, if you have a chance to go to a place like that, if not Borneo or Australia or South America, I mean, there are lots of interesting places in the world. You're all young. And you ought to you ought to make up a, a wish list for your life, and you know, and you just never know when the opportunities are going to come along, and 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 you better take the first one because there may not be a second one. So, um, and of course, almost anywhere you go, there are interesting herbs to to see. Now, you wanted to do, you have some some trivia, some questions. Oh, I mean, I. I think we were good with just asking. Uh, I think we were you good can, with food, you yeah. can ask us if you yeah. want, but we were just going to ask you kind of about interesting experiences. Oh, oh, I just gave you some. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that yeah, that, you know. <laughs> that was that was epic. I was going to ask you. You said I had to come up with trivia questions. Okay, here's one yeah. for you guys. Name the one species of turtle that lays eggs using its front legs. Okay, so, digs the hole with its front legs. So I I've, I've heard of this in one, in one species, but I don't think that this is the one you're thinking of. Okay, uh, so the, the okay that that's interesting. I so the ones that do double two clutches, the Maramis niger cans. I was thinking, but then the Pseudemidura. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Those you're, are two that they might you're on the right trouble. track, Michael. You're on the right track. It is. Yeah, it is. It's, it's Pseudemidura. There's only one species, and that's Umbrina, and it's only found in, in a couple of swamps in Western Australia. And they actually dig the hole with their front legs, and they they dig the hole with the front legs, and then they push the the dirt toward the back and then the hind legs can push it further out. But the initial digging is done with the front legs. And to my knowledge, that's the only turtle in the world. Now, why is that? I mean, why should there be, how many turtle species are there? 300, 350, whatever. That's the only one that does it that way. So I mean, obviously a turtle can do it because that species does it. So why haven't any other turtles done it that way? And and is is this a primitive condition, or is this is this a derived? Is is the is the what you know? Most turtles use their hind legs. You would think that that's the that's the the basal condition in turtles. And what Pseudemidura is doing is is the derived 
condition, okay? The evolved condition. But this is Australia, which has, you know, been separated from the rest of the world for a long, long time. Uh, so anyway, that's just a question for you. Uh, but it's a highly, it's the, it's the most endangered reptile species in all of Australia. But they are breeding them. It's just, it's just north of Perth, Australia, Western Australia. Okay. Bucket list. Bucket yeah. list. That you you want to yeah. see the turtle. Yes. That's oh, yes. And, and they're weird. They're, the, the shells are kind of almost square. Well, the other thing is they lay their eggs during the day in broad daylight. Now, how many turtles do you know that lay their eggs in broad daylight? They don't Very lay them. It's, this, is, this is a weird turtle. They also have a roofed over skull. It's completely uh, it's completely roofed over. They share that with sea turtles and like very oh. few other turtles. They have a lot of, they have several very strange char characteristics that that set them apart from the rest of the world's turtles. Yeah, there's 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 a there's a lot we need to know about this turtle, and unfortunately, it's it's so, extremely rare. They are breeding them. They're predated by introduced foxes, but uh, and and some people have published papers on them. But uh, I think we maybe we don't really know what its real evolutionary relationships are. Okay, here's another one. Uh, name a monotypic turtle family from Central America. Uh, the monotypic turtle family. Dermatomidae. The yes, sir. Bingo. Very good. The... I've never seen derm derm dermatemi so. I mean, Hopefully they're, this they're, summer. They're yeah, really this, this 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 guy's getting to go to Belize. I mean, I mean, I'm going yeah. to the Galapagos, so it's kind of a separate thing. But I've I've seen the, the I've seen shells of them at uh, in Peter Pritchard's collection, and I mean, some they, some of them are pretty big, like close to 20, 20 inches yeah, or so. Like, they get, very they get, impressive animal. Very impressive. Uh, unfortunately, people like to eat them, <laughs> so so yeah. they're they're. they're uh, Big ones are big ones are rare nowadays because of that. Like from, the... oh, I have some other questions, but that that's that's enough. You guys are doing, you know, one way or another. You you got the question, so I think we, or at least it, Michael got the the right general area for the first question. Yeah. Thinking this. Okay, are we we got another or we're no? That's, I've got some others, but that that's enough for now. I had some. Yeah. Other that yeah, so that works. All right. I think, well, we can wrap up now. Uh, that was, I think, a, a really interesting discussion. I, I learned a ton, and it was great to hear all the stories. Um, and, yeah, like you said, we but, didn't even get Sorry too much about turtles. You know, I haven't published much on turtles. Uh, but, uh, anyway, that's the way it is. <laughs> well, no, I think that it's it's interesting. If anything, it's it's there's a lot. It, it, it means that there's a lot to be learned, so... Yeah. Uh, going forward uh, for people listening and, and uh, maybe even some of us will tackle some of these questions. Uh, but Definitely it's been great to have you on Dr. Adler. It's been a real, it's been a pleasure. I hope to meet Ken in person, hopefully in, in Spokane and maybe I'll meet Jack in Florida somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The next few years. I went. And I, had, yep. I learned a lot this in this discussion. A lot more, considering a lot more now. So that's very. Uh, thank yep. you for coming on and, and uh, sharing your experiences and knowledge with us today. You bet. Let me just say this: I don't regret for a minute choosing to go on in, in a career in herpetology. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm technically a herpetologist, but I'm really an animal behaviorist. And uh, herps are wonderful organisms to use for certain kinds of experiments. And so uh, 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 it's, it's been a wonder. I've, I'm now retired for a number of years now, but uh, it, it's, it's been wonderful. I mean, uh, herps have been my entree to working with interesting people and being in wonderful universities and going out in the field and, and, and experiencing uh, interesting people, wonderful food, uh, you know, uh, and, and seeing an awful lot of 
animals, not just herps, but all kinds of animals in the wild. And uh, it's, it's been just a, a great career. I, I can't imagine uh, doing anything else. I mean, I'd do it all over again if I had a chance. I mean, obviously, be different research questions now, but uh, the, the point of working with herps as, as the group of organisms of interest and then do whatever kind of research with them that you want. So uh, there's plenty left to do, fellas. So uh, we'll expect to see your publications and, and so forth over the, these next years. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on. It's been great uh, for our listeners out there. Uh, like I said, the intro, you can find us at the turtleroom.org slash Colonia cast. Uh, this has been Dr. Craig Adler, and we will see you on the next episode.